Hello, Dr. D back with chapter one as promised. One thing I want to call to your attention about these short lectures is they certainly don't cover everything that you will need to know um, from that chapter. Chapter one is very short, only 13 pages I believe, and uh, it has a lot of good information. I'm going to focus on a couple of ideas um, that I think might be helpful to you. However, your best guide to what I expect you to know, once again, if you watch the welcome video, is the review material. The review material was specially chosen to make sure that you understand the most important concepts from the chapter. Remember, you can work those as many times as you like. So a couple of things. First, the folks who wrote your book did an excellent job. It's the best by far of the text that I looked at. However, in chapter one, in their effort to help you understand how medical terms are created or generated, or how to take them apart to understand a term you might not know, they um, get a little bit elaborate, perhaps more than we need to know. When you learn to speak as an infant, your parents probably didn't sit you down and hand you a dictionary and a grammar book and tell you this is how you should figure out how to talk. In some ways, the first chapter gets a little bit technical about having you construct and dissect medical terms. So I'm going to try to uh, take it out of those fancy boxes you'll find in your e-text and I hope reassure you that you already know more than you think you know. So bear with me while we do a silly little exercise and I hope I'll be able to uh, hold up the papers that I've made in the absence of having a lab with a whiteboard. So let's start with something that has nothing to do with medical terminology. If you have in your home a grade school age child or if you yourself are um, fond of these words you probably know immediately what they mean. A Tyrannosaurus, a Stegosaurus, and a Brontosaurus. All together now, they're dinosaurs. But if I ask you how do you know they're all dinosaurs, you would probably be able to tell me they all have the same ending. Another fancier term for an ending is a suffix. There we go, got it in the right spot. Have trouble getting them straight. Um, they all end in S-A-U-R-U-S, -U -U which is taken from the Greek word, uh, which led to the Latin word for reptile or lizard. So a Tyrannosaurus is a big scary lizard and so forth. I believe Brontosaurus means thunder lizard, if I remember correctly. Doesn't matter, they're all dinosaurs. So they all have the same root word, saurus, with a prefix that describes what kind of reptile or lizard they are. Now let me show you something else. These things I'm about to show you do not exist. They're just made up words. So if I ask you what do you think a minisaurus or a maxisaurus or an aquasaurus would be if it did exist, you probably realize, well I know what mini means, mini skirt, mini me. It means little. So that would be a little dinosaur. If I ask you what a maxisaurus was, you'd think that's a big dinosaur and an aquasaurus would be a dinosaur that lived in water. The point being, you can often take something you already know and by extension unravel something you might not know. That's how you learn to talk. That's how we learn things in context, as we say. So let me show you something. Another. These are some medical words, but they're ones I'll bet you've heard and you know. So we have here appendectomy and tonsillectomy. Probably some of you have had either or both of these procedures performed. So if you had a friend who had an appendectomy, what happened to them? They had their appendix out. And if they had a tonsillectomy, they had their tonsils out. So you've probably figured out that ectomy means we cut it out, and you're right. So you might be able to use that to unravel a word you may or may not have heard. I barely got it onto the paper here. This term is cholecystectomy. 
That is a very long word and kind of challenging for a poor speller like me to spell. But in case you don't know, what it means is we took a gallbladder out. Cholecyst is med speak for gallbladder. So cholecyst would be the root word and ectomy would be the suffix that means we took it out. Well, now that you know cholecyst cholecystectomy means removing a gallbladder, you might be able to figure out what this word means. Cholecystitis. Now, if that's confusing to you, let's work backwards and let me convince you that you do know exactly what that word means now that you know cholecyst means gallbladder. You know what these two words mean, tonsillitis and appendicitis. Tonsillitis means they're inflamed. Appendicitis means it's inflamed. So what do we know about that? If you see itis on the end of the word, it indicates inflammation. So that must mean cholecystitis means an inflamed gallbladder. And you're exactly right. So already you're using things you know to help you figure out things you might not know just by realizing the words have elements in common. And that's really what all those little boxes in chapter one are trying to explain to you. They also make a big deal about connecting uh, elements, usually the letter O, and that's only needed if you're going to ram up two vowels against each, I mean, excuse me, two consonants against each other and forming a word, and it just can't even be pronounced that way, so you add an extra O, and that's called a combining form. I think you would do that intuitively most of the time. So we know cholecystitis is an inflamed gallbladder. What if I wanted to find out what's going on in there? I might order a test called a cholecystogram. And if you know that gram, huh, what can that mean? It's more than just a kind of cracker. It's more than a unit of weight. Uh, how about if gram, if we thought about an electrocardiogram, that is an image of what's going on in your heart. So you might realize that cholecystogram is an image of what's happening in your gallbladder. And for those of you who are going into radiographic technology, that's something you'll be working with a lot. So the point being in chapter one, that we use elements of words, sort of like a set of Legos over and over to build up different longer terms, sometimes hugely long terms, but if you just take them apart bit by bit, you'll be able to figure out most of the time what they mean. So don't be scared. The next thing I want to address is one that does not come quite as easily or intuitively, and that's how medical terms generate plural forms. Here's the problem. Most of these terms are derived from Latin. Some of them came to us by way of Greek to Latin, and a few are Arabic or from um, other Asian languages, but the majority come from Greek and Latin, a few from German too. So these uh, words, when they become plural, revert to the rules of the language of origin. We're a little bit spoiled because most English nouns, when we want to make them plural, we simply add an S. So I have an ear here and an ear here, two ears. One eye, two eye, two eyes. One necklace, if I was wearing two necklaces, not hard. However, if you wanted to look at these, I have multiple tooths, but they aren't tooths, they're teeth. So we have irregular um, words in our regular English as well. And in fact, children at first their little brains have uh, processed the basic rule of adding an S, and they apply that rule as they learn to speak without even knowing it is a rule. For instance, if you have a toddler, they might tell you that because they have a foot on one leg and a foot on the other leg, they have two foots. And it makes perfect sense, but you and I know that for some reason we decided that two foots is a feat. So um, you're going to find the same kind of thing. You just have to memorize the irregular ones. After a while, and you, uh, when you've seen them written and heard enough, 
it becomes second nature, just like tooth to teeth or goose to geese. But at first, it may be just a bit um, challenging. Table 1.1, the first table in your book, gives some excellent examples of those. For instance, your kneecap, a patella, becomes patel I if you speak Latin or patel E. Either way, spelled with an A-E, depending on how uh, you choose to pronounce it. And you will hear different professionals pronounce it differently, depending on whether or not they're Latin scholars and which country or even region of the country they come from. Uh, so you're going to need to learn a lot of them. A finger bone, a phalanx, singular, becomes phalanges in plural. And it's all about the way these ancient languages, which had very elaborate rules for different sets of words, called declensions, went about making their plurals. Uh, I think the people who first created our medical language wanted to show how smart and learned they were so the terms very often show that they knew how to make plurals in the language of origin, and it stuck. At the end of your upper extremity, you have a couple of examples there. On this side, the thumb side, the bone in your forearm is called the radius, but the plural of that is radii because that kind of Latin word does it that way. First declension masculine, you don't care. I don't care that you know. On the other side, we have a bone called the ulna on the pinky side, and that is, uh, in plural, is also pronounced ulnae, but it's spelled U-L-N-A-E simply because it's first declension feminine. You don't need to memorize all those rules, even if you study that language, it's bewildering. You just sort of have to learn them the way you know that a foot and a foot equals feet. Um, hang around and eventually it'll sound natural to your ears, but be gentle with yourself in the meantime. And there's some exercises in your review and perhaps on your quiz that um, check to make sure that you've at least learned some of the basic ones. We'll pick up a lot more as we go along. So happy chapter one, just 13 pages. Remember, do the review questions, work them as many times as you like, and don't be scared about the quiz. Once again, you have 45 minutes, a very long time, to answer 25 multiple choice questions. I think that's all I have. Remember, we have a discussion board where you can um, put in general comments about the course, suggestions for improvement, and you do have my email and your syllabus if you have a question that's personal or unique to you. We'll get this done, uh, the first round of quiz, and we'll see how we do and if we need to regroup. Thanks for listening, and I'll be seeing you again at Chapter 2.